Well, good morning, everyone. It's nice to have such an exuberant crowd. I'm Maureen Zaremba with Education Programs at the John and Mabel Ringley Museum of Art. And on behalf of the staff, it gives us great pleasure to welcome you to this symposium on Paolo Veronese. At last evening's keynote address, I took a moment to thank my colleagues at New College, FSU and at the museum whose efforts have made this program possible. And for those of you who weren't in attendance tonight, <clears throat> last night, you can catch it uh, on the webcast, which will be archived on the museum's website. Um, but we want to give a special shout out to Jeff Thomas, our colleague at New College, who wasn't here last night, but who has treated this event at, as if it were his own. So thank you to Jeff back there. So good planning is only one aspect of producing a good program. Great content makes it compelling and engaging and creates a meaningful body of knowledge. This program brings together some of the world's leading experts on Veronese and Venetian art 
who have been more than generous in sharing their time and expertise. We look forward to new insights and new perspectives on this remarkable artist. Now, a few words about procedures. You can see that the program is divided into sessions consisting of two papers. Now, we have allotted 30 minutes for each paper. And I know our presenters have worked really hard to stay within those boundaries. Um, but of course, we, we know what happens really. <laughs> but here's my disclaimer. If we go too far over, we're not going to be able to take breaks, which means no coffee. So <laughs> the pressure's on, guys. Um, so um, after this morning's presentation, we're going to take a lunch break. Uh, for those of you who have made reservations at Treviso, uh, there will be a tram uh, available to take you over there. Uh, and for those of you who haven't made reservations and you need some sort of local recommendation, you can ask one of the staff to help with that. Um, this is a live webcast, so again, feel free to get the word out to friends and colleagues. Um, they can log on to the museum's website, which is www.ringling.org, and there's a direct link to these proceedings. A reminder for everyone to turn off your cell phones. Looks like everyone has. Um, and because of the webcast, and also it's just um, can be distracting for the speakers, please no flash photography. So, without any further ado, I think we would like to begin. Dr. Brilliant. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody, and, um, and welcome, we're, welcome, first of all, to our symposium, Paolo, New Perspectives on Paolo Veronese, which is uh, in celebration of the exhibition Paolo Veronese, a master in his workshop in Renaissance Venice. Um, before we get started, I'm Virginia Brilliant. I'm the Ula R. Searing Curator of Collections at the Ringling and also the curator of the exhibition. Um, and I have the great pleasure of introducing all of our speakers today. Um, I'd also, before I get started, I just wanted to welcome um, not just everyone, but also all of the all of the colleagues and friends who've joined us from around the country and abroad, both um, to speak here at the symposium, but also uh, to participate in the proceedings. So thank you so much for being here, and welcome to Florida. Um, I'd also like to make a quick thank you um, to my colleagues in the education department, uh, Maureen Zaremba, Barbara Hyde, and Sonia Kita. They make absolutely every part of this um, this this event come you know come into being, and I'm so grateful to work with such fabulous, wonderful women who just make all of my wants and hopes and dreams for these events come true. So thank you, ladies. I won't clap into the microphone. Sorry. Um, but let's let's get started. Um, so first, I would like to welcome our fir our, our, our first speaker, Dr. Tracy Cooper. Um, Tracy Cooper is the professor of art history at Temple University in Philadelphia. She received her PhD from Princeton University and is a specialist in Venetian and early modern cultural history, with particular interests in architecture and urbanism and patronage studies. Her book, Palladio's Venice, Architecture and Society in a Renaissance Republic, published in 2006, received several prestigious awards and was widely reviewed. A co-edited volume on the sensuous and the counter-reformation church is forthcoming in 2013, featuring her own essay on the sensuous recent counter-reformation research. Other current publications inclu um, include Diletto di Musica, The Place of Music in the Artist's Home in the Proceedings of the British Academy, 2012, and Viaggia Cice Veneziana in Reflections on Renaissance Venice, 2013. Today, she will be speaking to us about Veronese's vision of Alantica architecture. Welcome, Tracy.
Good morning, everyone. I'd like to start off my, with my particular thanks for the invitation to participate from Virginia Brilliant and the Ringling Museum's terrific Maureen Zaremba, Sonia Kida, and Barbara Hyde, and no doubt many others, for the splendid organization of today's symposium in celebration of the Palo Veronese exhibition. I was pleased to be asked to speak on the artist and architecture as Palo Veronese was one of the most affective, even subversive, promoters of al antique architecture among his Renaissance contemporaries. Painters, sculptors, architects, theorists, playwrights, and patrons. Through his knowledge of and participation in the new architectural culture and through his persuasive powers of representation. Majestic architectural settings that stage a narrative for the viewer or surround the beholder within an ar illusionistic architectural space are hallmarks of Paolo Veronese's interpretation of the classical position on art. Two general themes of scholarship on this subject have predominated in recent years. The more productive being most eloquently articulated by our keynote speaker, David Rosand, aligning what he described as an interpretation of Vitruvian theater with the tradition of Venetian tableau painting. The second, whereas annoyingly persistent, was witnessed my referral, particularly in Palladio scholarship, is the assumption on negative grounds that Veronese's pictorial contributions went too far in its illusionism, thereby violating the actual architectural structure. This last has been adduced from the negative, that Veronese's contribution of frescoes to the Villa Barbaro at Mazer go unmentioned in Palladio's I Quattro Libri dell'Architettura. I would propose rather that the strict comparison of the older architect and younger painter may be misleading in regard to innovation in architectural culture in this period, and that the interpretation of al antica style in the Veneto was a broader enterprise and sometimes more successfully inserted in the conservative environment of Venice itself through pictorial representation than what would be allowable in built architecture. Furthermore, Veronese's expertise would draw on the experiences of his earliest years, having been born to a stonecutter or Spezza Preda in 1528, and therefore sensitized to architectural vocabulary. Veronese, Veronese's birthplace had a distinguished heritage of antiquities, as touched on in several of the excellent essays in the catalog that accompanies the Ringling exhibition. Indeed, North Italian antiquarians and epigraphers were at the heart of classical discovery and revival in the Quattrocento. The advent of the printed illustrated book publicized these monuments, as with Torella Serena's 1542 Antiquities of Verona, which included illustrations by the painter Giovanni Carotto, Veronese's master, again an indication of his further education in architecture. And the first illustration, sorry, the first illustrated edition of Vitruvius had been produced in 1511 by the Veronese architect and engineer Fra Giacondo. Of course, Veronese had no further to look than the fabric of the city itself then embedded in the medieval city wall as the gate to the Roman Via Postumia, was one of the most studied of the surviving monumental triumphal arches outside Rome, the Arco di Gavi, a tetrapile arch adorned in the Corinthian order with the trabeated tympanum. The mid-first century monument was signed by Lucio Vitruvius Cerdo, who has been related to the Mar Marcus Vitruvius Polio of the celebrated early first century 10 books on architecture. The name certainly contributed to the prestige of the monument and its authority. The Arco de Gavi was internationally known, disseminated through many treatises on classical architecture, such as the 1549 Book of Arches by Frenchman Jacques Androuet du Cerceau. Such sources proliferated in the first half of the 16th century. These were sources that graphically translated the three-dimensional into the two-dimensional 
and were eagerly consumed by painters as well as architects. Both the processes of visual transcription and those of literal translation produced architecture that strove to emulate the classical, but was itself bound to its own time. Hence, all antica, not antique. Palladio, famous for his 1574 books of architecture, had planned a separate volume on arches, and he also carefully drew this local example. Note the precision of his rendering, cleanly executed with a graphic sensibility appropriate to its purpose as an ideal example for building. Whereas, on the other hand, the fragmentation of views, both front and side elevations, and grand plan are shown privilege representation over perspective, and may well relate to some of the same pictorial conventions Veronese would employ. Yet it can be argued that Veronese had a strongly developed all antica architectural sensibility before ever encountering Palladia. His formative exposure to antiquities in the local environment the imposing monumental remains in Verona, and his father's employment would have contributed to his sensitivity to details and materials and spatial massing and urban settings. Plus, although Palladio was exactly 20 years older, he got a very late start, which meant his independent career as an architect was nearly parallel to the younger Veronese. Rather, the model for contemporary all antique architecture in Verona was the esteemed architect and engineer to the Republic of Venice, Michele San Michele, born in 1584 and dying in 1559, who Vasari testified as to the close relationship he had to Paolo. San Michele was heir to Veronese predecessors, to whom Vasari had attributed the introduction to North Italy of the Roman Renaissance style notably John Maria Falconetto, a painter and architect, and the previously mentioned Vitruvian, Fra Giocondo, who was also co-architect with Raphael on St. Peter's. From his own time in Rome, San Michele imported the two-story palace type developed by Bramante and united it with a distinctly North Italian vocabulary of ornament, drafted stone basement, balustrated parapet, hierarchical use of orders, a flat roof with overhanging cornice, all could be found in Bramante. But the addition of sculptural keystones, wing victories and spandrels, the elaborate festoon foliated frieze, and complex rhythm of bays and alternating diagonal column, columnar fluting was common in the Veneto. A stonecutter's son would have appreciated the skill represented by the ornament. In addition to the Alantica vocabulary, San Michele has been credited with introducing a scenographic rather than perspectival approach to architecture by the distinguished urban historian Giulio Carlo Argon. Quote, perspective space achieves unity through proportional relationships. It has a tangible quality. It is bounded and understood through the continuity of the wall plane. Scenographic space is physically discontinuous. Its unity is perceptual rather than physical. It relies on the ground plane rather than the wall. The ephemeral quality of scenographic space results from these reverberations of the mind as it constructs a logical whole from the discrete components assembled on the wall plane. Argon's observations about San Michele's role in developing scenographic space resonate with the analysis by David Rosand of Veronese's staging of the narrative in the family of Darius before Alexander. And I quote, the action unfolding across the surface as a frieze is obviously staged according to different conventions than Renaissance perspective inventions and involved the staging of dramatic productions before a purely architectural backdrop rather than within an illusionistic set." End quote. Veronese's architectural backdrop shares a number of motifs with those of San Michele in this and in a number of his other works. 
Here you see winged victories in the spandrels of the arches, prominent keystones, elaborate festoon friezes, protruding medallions, double baluster parapet, and drafted stone rustication. Or here, in the Palazzo Pompeii, San Michele's influential importation of Roman Renaissance elements included a rusticated ground story, paired orders, a Bramantesque Salaregia type window, which would later become known <coughs> through its printed versions as a Seriliana and later the Palladian window, a crowning double balustrade with statues over the orders, and a tripartite organization common to Venetian palaces. Particular to San Michele are the flat planar surfaces with complex rhythmic solid and void alternations. Along with the work of other leading architects, such as Jacopo Sansovino and Giulio Romano, San Michele was a model for Andrea Palladio in his early independent commissions in Vicenza. A number of the elements described above can be seen in Palladio's Palazzo di Porto, where Palladio meant to emulate the ancient house. Originally, frescoes by Veronese decorated the ground floor, now lost, which was the main living space, unlike Rome, where it was usually occupied by shops. Veronese also executed portraits of the da Portos between 1551 and 52, which do survive and demonstrate networks of shared patronage and of commissions. This was also true for the Darius, which hung in the villa for Francesco Pisani, designed by Palladio. San Michele was an architect of prestige in the Venetian Empire and also was established in Venice itself with patronage from the highest circles among the network promoting the introduction of all antica architecture in the face of a conservative tradition, including such patrons as the Grimani and Corner. It seems that it may have been these connections that sponsored the youthful Veronese in Venice circa 1550 for the Justinian family chapel in San Francesco della Vigna. The church was patronized by other interrelated families, such as the Grimani and Barbaro. Even prior to arriving in Venice, Veronese had employed monumental architecture in his compositions, adopting the asymmetry of Titian's Pesaro altarpiece before ever arriving in the capital itself. Interestingly, one of the criticisms of Palladio's facade for the church was his use of high pedestals, yet they seem to be congruent with the pictorial representation of Veronese's Alantica architecture. It may be proposed that Veronese was more of an architectural innovator and student of the ancient classical architecture than has been recognized. Their circle was shared with the towering intellect of the period, Daniele Barbaro, author of the program for Veronese's first public commission in Venice in the Ducal Palace in the Hall of the Council of Ten. Barbaro and Palladio were in Rome together in 1554 in preparation for the commentaries on Vitruvius published in 1556 by uh, Daniele Barbaro with illustrations by Palladio. The model for illustrating Vitruvius was the Veronese Fra Giocondo's earlier edition of 1511. Like San Michele, Fra Giocondo was an engineer and is one of the distinctions noted by Argon as being due to a military functionality with emphasis on the ground plane and a general theory of relations among spectator, space, and plastic representation that is characteristic. Celebrated collaboration between Barbaro, Palladio, and Veronese matures with the Villa Barbaro at Mazer from the early 1550s. Viewed frontally from a distance or from closer up, it has the same scenographic quality as the backdrop in Veronese's family of Darius, where the viewer inhabits the anterior space. Its actual projection is disguised. 
quote, the dominant frontality is reinforced by rigid axial symmetry and discontinuity of vertical planes receding in depth, end quote. These qualities led Rudolf Wittkover also to describe Palladio's spatial conception as scenographic. Veronese's interior decoration for the villa between 1558 and 61 is the pictorial equivalent of San Michele's and Palladio's architectural scenographia. Here in the cruciform hall, the painter invites continuity between the viewer, its actual habitants, and depicted figures. Continuity is intensified by the inclusion of family portraits. Here, the wife of Daniele's brother, Marc Antonio, Justina Justinian Barbaro, whose father was Veronese's early patron at San Francesco della Vigna, as well as at the Ducal Palace. She's shown here in the room of the Olympus on a splendid di Sotto in Su parapet with striking Solomonic columns, an architecturally rhetorical device that we'll see Veronese develop through his work. Veronese is superbly tuned into Alantica architectural culture as being interpreted in the Vitruvian commentary of Daniele Barbaro and by practicing architects. Spatial continuity of interior and exterior, which would have been even stronger with the original ceiling pergola decoration, is a continuation between painted and actual space. For example, a quintessentially all antique element is the baluster, a Renaissance invention thought to be classical, recommended by Sebastiano Serlio for the princely house. Veronese's dropped baluster mirrors perfectly the actual balusters used by Palladia. Such an illusionistic pictorial system had to accommodate not only spatial continuity, but temporal continuity allowing for the dimensions of past and present, from ancient ruins to contemporary Alantica villas, including elsewhere in the villa, in the Sala di Bacchus, a portrait of the Villa Barbaro itself. Another example of this can be seen in the architectural portrait of the Cucina family palace in the scene of their presentation to the Madonna that graced their portico. We heard from David Roseanne last night about how Veronese, in his famous defense of his work of the uh, Last Supper, renamed the Feast in the House of Levi, before the Inquisition, demonstrated his consciousness about the decorum of narrative action and space, and how his use of architectural elements defined the stage naturalistically. The marvelous laboratory for his demonstration of principles of continuity between actor and audience with corresponding spatial and temporal hierarchies could already have been found prior to the Villa Barbaro at San Sebastiano in Venice, being brilliantly restored by, say, Venice. A teeny article by David Rosen from 1972 references a pre-1966 campaign of, re of restoration. In that article, he drew attention to the play between representation of the local audience, monks, whose prior, by the way, was also from Verona, as participants in the larger actions taking place in different times across the spaces of the church. The monks' architecture in their choir, or barco, was distinguished typologically from the Solomonic columns framing the name saints' narrative scenes. Veronese's successful campaigns at San Sebastiano between 1555 to 70 began with his transfer to Venice at the age of 28. With the organ loft, we have the literal demonstration of his architectural imagination and skill. Veronese painted and decorated the organ loft of San Sebastiano between 1558 and 60. He devised a special design for the organ casing, which was executed following his orders by a master Domenico from Treviso. The gildings and carvings were made by 
Francesco Fiorentino and Bartolomeo Bolognese, in other words, the Florentine and somebody from Bologna. Veronese painted organ shutters, so we have a Treviso, Bologna, Florence. Uh, Veronese painted organ shutters depicting the presentation of Jesus in the temple when it was closed and the miracle of the pool of Beth Bethesda when it's opened. The latter is the scene that you see here. The majestic columns of the Pool of Bethesda are interpolated into the pre-existing painted context, layering physical and represented architecture. Veronese also designed the new apse for the church, and this suggests his closer involvement with currents of architectural reform, such as his high altar for Montagnana in 1555, where he was uh, again associated with Francesco Pisani, the patron of Palladio, who was asked to rebuild the choir. Precedents could again be found in Verona, such as San Michele's choir, or Tournacor, as it's called from the shape of the choir, that was created under the reform of Bishop Matteo Giberti and suggested parallels make their way into Veronese's imagery. The triumphal character of Veronese's architectural vocabulary is, in my view, the expression of an evolving attitude toward Alantica architecture than has been perhaps understood previously. The subject of the nativity, for example, is generally shown as a uh, contrast between the decadence of the classical world as succeeded by the Christian. Veronese instead elevates the antique as becoming renewed. It has been appropriated and reclaimed. He was acutely aware of the architectural vocabulary that promoted this rhetorical process and developed the pictorial architecture to reinforce it. The theory of the Solomonic or Ezekiel order was being developed during this same time. Such Alantica references to the temple served in this installation to reify the state with the performance of magnificence. This is reinforced by the mixed perspective system that accommodated diverse points of view perceptually. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Let's see if we go back. Odd. Well, imagine. <laughs> this program is made explicit in Paolo Peruta's dialogue, Della Perfezione della Vita Politica. And I think I will go back so we can look at something. Published in Venice in 1579, but it was set as a conversation that took place at Trent in 1563. Nominally, a debate on the relative merits of the active or contemplative life, Peruta gave Giovanni Grimani, patriarch of Aquileia, the voice for introducing his co-adjutor Daniele Barbaro's works, both the commentary and translation of Vitruvius's 10 books and his treatise on perspective, which establishes Barbaro among the interlocutors as a figure of authority on architecture, and conversely, Grimani as well. Barbaro is asked for a description of great works, opere grandi, that impart magnificence as a virtue of nobility. Quote, magnificence, responded Barbaro, as a virtue of nobility is itself worthy of not just any work. So there is not often occasion to demonstrate it, but in those things where it is usually employed, which one does only on rare occasions, like banquets, weddings, buildings, where it becomes one to spend without consideration of expense, but only to the grandeur and beauty of the work. Barbaro adds that other appropriate use are for feasts, public games, livery, and the building of temples of palaces or of other public and private edifices. Such things, if they have suitable grandeur, and if they are made with noble devices and with suitable decorum, they render the man worthy of the name magnifico. 
the participants in Peruta's dialogue then debated the lost magnificence of ancient buildings and whether modern buildings partake of such virtue. Quote, but in the grandeur and ornament of temples, does it not appear to you all that the moderns that have begun to buy with the ancients? Recovery of the ancient theater was a preoccupation in all Antica culture. A performative approach to representation can be linked to theatrical enterprises in which Veronese was directly involved, in the same circles as Palladio, for example. These costumes were a 1562 performance of Sofonisba by Vicentine humanist John Giorgio Trissino, which was staged in a temporary theater built by Palladio. The Teatro Olimpico in Vicenza would be the first permanent modern theater and was one of Palladio's last works. He died in 1580. It realized the Vitruvian researches of Barbaro, and Palladio's scenographic conception posits continuity between audience and performer, as has been proposed for Veronese's compositional strategies. Mm. The... Teatro Olimpico in, uh, sorry, it was completed by Vincenzo Scomozzi, and Veronese would contribute to the performance of Oedipus uh, Tyrant in 1585. Thus, performativity and magnificence seem a key to understanding choices made in the work of Veronese as a solution to incorporating the actions or imprese of great men expressing the quality of magnificence which was always ambiguously regarded. The appeal to performance may also explain his attraction for contemporary artists such as Thomas Struth, even despite the incongruity of the costume for continuity between audience and uh, represented uh, actors. In filmmaker Peter Greenaway's 2009 Venice Biennale project in the refectory at San Giorgio Maggiore, the wedding at Cana formed the third in a series of nine classic paintings after Rembrandt's Night Watch and Leonardo's Last Supper, which suggests its high status. In this view, we see how the actual architecture is related to that of the digital video of the painting in situ. Seen frontally, the scenographic continuity between architecture, space, and painting, audience and actors, is dramatized. Seen in its frame, there is a visceral sense of loss with its separation from the site where Veronese worked for his bread and wine while painting it. If this drawing in the Louvre, you see the recto in front and verso behind, is by Veronese as the Louvre and some scholars think, I'm sure I'm going to hear about this, um, it reveals a fundamentally architectural approach, rendering buildings in elevation and grand plan a requirement for spatial rather than pictorial elevation. One of Veronese's last works is a moving testament to his intimate involvement with the promotion of Valentica culture in Venice. It was made for Palladio's first work in the capital, the High Altar of San Pantalon, which has now been dismantled. And at the time, Veronese was himself embarking at San Sebastiano. He would execute the altarpiece then some 30 years later, eight years after Palladio's death. The miracle is about to happen. San Pantalon will resuscitate the boy lying on a slab of classical molding, while a famous antiquity from the Grimani collection looks off stage to the right. The stonecutter's son from Verona was one of the most effective promoters of all antique architecture. Through his demonstrable mastery of architectural principles and of details, his understanding of classical ornament, his interest in contemporary architects and their interpretations of classical buildings, 
and through his desire to represent the elements of magnificence and the treatment of the subjects that have, as David Rosand pointed out, so often been termed decorative, perhaps a misunderstanding of these very qualities for which he was so admired in his own time. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Virginia, for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you for letting me be an interloper in the world of Veronese for the next 30 minutes. Um, and thank you to the, the, the great staff here at the Wrinkling for making the trip so uh, effortless and hospitable. Um, now to interlope. Um, the Villa Cornaro at PMB in Odessa, a small town between Castelfranco and Venice, may seem an unlikely place to begin a lecture on Veronese and sculpture. Uh, the villa was only completed after uh, Veronese's death, and there's no indication that any of his paintings ever adorned its walls. What the villa does hold are eight sculptures that are as close to Veronese in style as any in the Veneto. Um, they're found straight through to the back of the house, where the visitor emerges in a beautiful light-filled salon surrounded by eight niches that are decorated with full-length portraits of prominent members of the Cornaro family. They're by a sculptor from Vicenza named Camillo Mariani, and they date to about 1595, thus to about seven years after Veronese's death. The stylistic debt that the uh, sculptures pay to the great painter is easily appreciated with comparisons like this one. On the left, Mariani's portrait of Caterina Cornaro, on the right, Veronese's portrait of a woman at the Louvre. Um, the sculpted portrait evokes the painted one and its sense of elegance, attention to decorative refinement, and there are also similarities in the facial type and uh, uh, the pose. You notice both women bringing their right hand up to their chest and also fidgeting with their drapery with their left hands. I show another view of the sculpture, which draws out the pearl necklace worn by the sculpted figure, a detail, of course, also appearing in the patent portrait. Um, and uh, you also notice the similarities in the treatment of the hair. The, the men, too, are endowed with a quality that would seem to owe something to the paintings of Veronese. And I show this commander, Zorzi Cornaro, alongside Veronese's portrait of Agostino Barbaro. 
Um, comparisons, obviously, suggestive for the bearded faces and uh, the similarities in costume. That the sculpture must somehow be connected to Veronese um, also seems the inescapable conclusion when it's um, put alongside some of his uh, full-length portrayals of men in armor. All three men, with their strident poses, communicate the same measure of, of authority and of confidence. Now, what I've not mentioned about these sculptures is their material. They're all made of stucco, and stucco will be the guiding theme of my remarks this morning. Um, I will explore the influence of stucco sculpture on Veronese and also his con contributions to the tradition of stucco sculpture in the Veneto. Now, I freely confess, if I, if I were up here right now giving a, a properly balanced lecture on Veronese and sculpture, um, stucco would not be at the fore. It's, it's one thread of a much larger topic. But I choose to highlight it um, because it's gone largely unexplored in the scholarly literature. Um, and I think you'll find that it offers some rich fruit for the picking. Um, now, all that being said, I, I don't want my lecture to skew too far in the direction of stucco, which is why I'll begin with some, some general remarks um, about the place of sculpture and certain sculptors in Veronese's uh, career and art. Now, first, Veronese was no Tintoretto, who was famously obsessed with Michelangelo, wanting many models after his sculptures, such as one after the day, which he drew over and over and over again from all variety of angles. And then he would take these studies and incorporate them into his paintings, as demonstrated by the miracle of the slave, where the pose of the day makes two appearances here and here. Um, no, Ver Veronese was not like Tintoretto. He was never fanatical about any one sculpture or sculptor in the way that Tintoretto was fanatical about um, Michelangelo, which is not to say that Veronese was insensitive to his sculptural world, as, as Tracy touched on. And in fact, based on what we know about his upbringing in, in Verona, um, he would seem to have been practically programmed from an early age to be highly attuned to his three-dimensional world. Um, we've heard about the fact that his father was a stone cutter, not a figurative sculptor, mind you, but someone who belonged to the building trade. Um, and, and secondly, according to Veronese's earliest biographer, Carlo Rodolfi, he had the habit of um, supposedly making small models in clay. Now, this could be uh, an apocryphal report. Um, if not, and the, and the practice um, continued in his life, the only indication is that Veronese was particularly gifted at being able to endow his painted figures with a credible and convincing sense of, of three-dimensionality, which could signal that they had been studied from models he had prepared himself. As Veronese reached maturity, he encountered two sculptors who proved meaningful for him in various ways. Um, the older, and by a lot, 42 years, was Jacopo Sansovino, who had arrived in Venice from, from central Italy, from Florence, in 1527, and would become the dominant architect and sculptor in the city. Um, in 1557, Sansovino joined Titian in awarding um, Veronese the prize for the best painting in the newly completed reading room of the Libreria Marciana. Uh, and this would be the, the, the first encounter between the sculptor and the painter. Um, the second would happen a short time later when Sansovino was hired to um, execute the tomb on the right side of the nave of San Sebastiano, uh, right when Veronese uh, was very much engaged on his cycle of paintings. In 1559, Veronese was asked to design the high altar, um, sorry, high altar of San Sebastiano, um, and he not only re responded to Sansovino's tomb, um, but also engaged the same construction firm. Uh, with the organ loft on the left, he, he too seems to have been thinking about how to balance the tomb. But uh, here we've, we've wandered back into Tracy's talk in the world of architecture. Um, to put us back on track, did Sansovino's sculpture exert any real influence on Veronese's art? Um, Veronese was, was definitely impressionable to uh, Sansovino's Madonnas and Child, and, and notice the uh, common motif of the, the children playing with drapery over their head. Um, what's more, the sculpture on the left did not go on public view until after the painting, which is evidence that um, Sansovino and Veronese must have been on intima, intimate enough terms that he was occasionally given invitations to Sansovino's studio. Um, at times, Veronese led his admiration for Sansovino 
show more expressly, quoting figures in full. And a, a clear demonstration of this is uh, on the left, Sansovino's bronze piece in the Loggetta in Piazza San Marco. And on the uh, right, a nearly identical piece um, executed, uh, painted by Veronese as part of his decorations in, in fictive bronze here um, for the Villa Barbaro at Mazer. The second sculptor to whom Veronese owed a great deal was Alessandro Vittoria, an almost exact contemporary. Um, I do believe this portrait by Veronese is of Vittoria, and that it stands as proof of the close relationship that existed between the sculptor and the painter. On select occasions, um, Veronese would quote Vittoria as he did San Savino, more or less um, in full, as, as demonstrated here with Alessandro Vittoria's famous um, St. Sebastian and San Francesco della Vigna, and on the right, um, the same figure, just in reverse, um, painted by Veronese as part of his decorations in the Sala del Collegio in the Palazzo Ducale. How else Vittoria influenced uh, Veronese brings us back to our central theme of stucco. Uh, Vittoria was an exceptionally gifted stuccoist, um, the most innovative stuccoist of his generation. Um, Vittoria's earliest masterpiece in the medium are found at the Palazzo Tiene in Vicenza. Uh, among the rooms he decorated at the palace was the Sala dei Principi, which is uh, amazing for its three-dimensionality. The Alantica bust that, that ring the inside of the octagonal room are executed in an almost totally high relief, and these figures lounging around the cornice, um, they too are possessed with a great deal of three-dimensionality. Now, at almost precisely the same moment Vittoria was beginning these stuccos, Veronese was just up the road near Castel Franco, completing the most uh, important fresco cycle, uh, cycle to date of his career, those at the Villa Soranza. And we all know, sadly, that the Villa Soranza no longer really exists. Uh, we do have a few fragments that survive from the interior decorations. And, and one of these is here on the screen, which shows that Veronese believed that uh, an important part of Alantica decoration was the incorporation of illusionistic sculpture. And not sculpture that was meant to seem in low relief, but, but monumental, almost freestanding, like Vittoria's stuccos at the Palazzo Tiene. The illusionistic sculptures are, are just visible here on the edges, and they form a very deep niche in which the, the real figure, the colored figure, um, can stand. Now, I take this moment to clarify that Veronese belonged to a long tradition of illusionistic wall painting in northern Italy, a, a tradition with exceedingly deep roots in his native Verona. Um, one of the principal innovators was the architect and painter Giovanni Maria Falconetto, and I show a representative uh, example of his decorations on the screen. These date to about 1517, thus to almost a, a decade before the birth of Veronese. Um, Falconetto, as we've learned, was a devoted student of classical art and architecture. And of course, he was in the right city to feed his fascination, Verona. Um, then as now, Verona ranked second to Rome in, in, in a number of surviving classical ruins. Um, but this did not prevent Falconetto from wanting to go to Rome, and he did spend a lengthy period of study there during the 1490s, a, a trip that cemented his appreciation for the role played by sculpture in classical decorative programs. And you see um, some of that here with the beautiful, especially grisaille reliefs that are below the central narrative panels. The thought can only have occurred to Falconetto early on that there, there, there must be a better way, a more real way to suggest the art of the ancients. Um, his answer was stucco, uh, which he began introducing into his buildings during the late 1530s. And I show the most important example on the screen, the Loggia and Odeon Cornaro in Padua. Um, inside the Odeon, the, the building here on the right, uh, a local Paduan sculptor named Tiziano Minio filled the ceilings with these uh, beautiful low reliefs in stucco. Now, it's important to note that the stuccos date to about 1540, which is nearly a decade after Falconetto had completed the building. Um, the reason for the delay is that stucco was a technology that only began to permeate the Veneto during the mid-1530s. The artist responsible for importing it was Giovanni da Udine, who had discovered in Rome um, the secret to how the ancients had made the, the beautiful, glistening white stucco that had come to be appreciated in places like Nero's Domus Aurea. 
Um, the secret was marble dust and combining marble dust in a ratio of basically two to one with lime. And Giovanni de Udine brought that secret back with him to his native Udine near Venice about 1534, launching the birth of stucco sculpture in the Veneto. Um, it didn't take long for stucco to be used for more than low reliefs. Um, here at the Loggia and Odeon Cornaro, um, Tiziano Minio made Falconetto's buildings look properly classical by fitting out their facades with high relief in stucco, these here in those niches. As Veronese grew up, he was surrounded by men who took it on faith that for a building to look classical, it had to incorporate sculpted elements, or at least appear that it incorporated sculpted elements through illusionistic painting. We've heard about one of these men, Giovanni Carotto, a painter and a scholar. Veronese is likely to have been working in his uh, studio just about 1540 as Carotto was preparing these illustrations for this guide to Verona. And uh, I showed two of the woodcut illustrations on the screen. And they helped to demonstrate um, the way that Carotto was very keen to conduct his own imaginative reconstructions, filling the bare ruins with sculptures, both freestanding ones as well as relief. The other man we've also heard about this morning, uh, Michele San Michele, um, who was, uh, again, critical to teaching Veronese about classical decor and the place of sculpture in it. Um, these are three of Michele San Michele's buildings um, in Verona, all new constructions when Veronese was a toddler. Um, and, and like Falconetto, again, he was committed to reviving the glory of ancient art and architecture. Um, also like Falconetto, he'd spent a considerable time in Rome during his early maturity, and uh, it was in Rome that he was able to experience at close range the new styles of Alantica architecture um, that were beginning to be practiced there by central Italian architects like Antonio da San Gallo. The connection between San Michele and Veronese is underscored by the fact that the Villa Soranza, where Veronese painted the figure on the left, uh, was designed by San Michele. Furthermore, it was San Michele who extended the invitation to Veronese, like a father, to help carry out the interior decorations. Again, Veronese was painting at La Serranza um, almost precisely at the moment that Vittoria was in Vicenza, uh, finishing up the stuccos at the Palazzo Tiene. With only a few years of the stuccos at the Palazzo Tiene, Vittoria would take his stucco sculptures to the next logical level. Um, he made them almost completely in the round as, as true substitutes for full-length works in marble. This happened at the Villa Pisani in Montagnana, and we know that Veronese almost certainly would have seen these stuccos as he signed a contract for the altarpiece at Montagnana in this building. Um, the stuccos in question are located inside in the main atrium, and, and I show one of them on the screen. It's a cycle of seasons, and this is winter, and it's a profound look of sculpture and its complex torsions, interesting gesture of displayed figures, and developed sense of musculature. Clearly, Vittoria was not bothered by the fact he was using stucco instead of more noble marble, which introduces an important point. Uh, the 1550s begins the time when stucco was no longer being seen as a cheap way to duplicate marble, but as an independent medium with its own artistic advantages. And I just named one. Stucco is a much more forgiving material than marble. Yes, it, it dries quickly, more quickly than clay, which reduces the amount of time in which it can be actively modeled. Um, but if an error is committed in stucco, that error can be um, pretty easily remedied, and, and especially without the cost. This made it an excellent platform for stylistic experimentation. It had all the appearance of marble um, without the risk or a lot of the trouble. The response by Veronese to the flourishing of stucco sculpture was to continue to employ illusionistic sculpture in his decorative programs. Um, the upper parts of San Sebastiano are, are full of them. i show one example here. Um, Veronese also painted these beautiful illusionistic roundels for the ceiling, but they're of a completely different breed um, than the stuccos up above, which are insistently sculptural. And this uh, insistent sculpturality um, uh, can also describe his stuccos at the Villa Barbaro at Mazer, and I mean the ones such as these between the columns and over the doors. Um, 
again, these are, are very bold three-dimensional figures that, that certainly give the impression of being in high relief, if not in total relief. How did contemporary viewers read them uh, as fictive marbles or fictive stuccos? Had the works of Vittoria conditioned viewers to accept illusionistic sculpture for what it would be if it was actually executed in real life? Um, to ask differently, when Veronese thought to paint these figures, he, did he think he was painting fictive marbles or fictive stuccos? My answer to the last question is, is fictive stuccos, and I find it telling that in his many descriptions of Veronese's frescoes, Rodolfi never uses the term marmo finto, or, or fake marble, but he does use on occasion the term stucco finto, or, or fake stucco. By following Vittoria's lead and filling his decorative programs like this one at the Villa Barbaro with big, impressive, illusionistic sculptures that are likely to have been read as stucchi finti, Veronese was very much participating in a phenomenon more or less unique to the Veneto, the ennobling of stucco. As stucco came to be appreciated as a noble medium, one in the same league as marble and bronze, um, sculptors were increasingly encouraged to use it for their most serious masterworks of sculpture. Now, I wish to provide two indications of the new prestige being accorded stucco in Veronese's Veneto, two of many. The earlier is found just outside the, the Villa Barbaro in the Gardum Nymphaeum at back. These stuccos were executed probably a year or two before Veronese began his frescoes inside. Um, they're relatively amateurist works, which helps to secure their attribution to the junior patron of the villa, Mark Antonio Barbaro. Now, I, I don't mean to suggest that, that Mark Antonio was out in the hot sun every day getting his hands messy with stucco. Um, rather, he would have uh, furnished the designs for the stucco and probably watched um, with, with some enthusiasm as some local equipe um, endeavored to carry out his designs. I mean, I'm sure on some occasion he might have gone out and, and, and done a little modeling. But in any case, um, what is among the reasons that helps to secure the attribution is that we, we do know for a fact that Mark Antonio Barbaro was an amateur stuccoist. Um, as Pietro Aretino writes to Barbaro in 1546, not only in painting do you exercise that gift which nature gave to you in infancy, but also in stucco work and in drafting. Here, stucco joins painting and drawing as pursuits appropriate for a gentleman which is unlikely to be the case if its status when within the hierarchy of sculptural materials was not close to those of the two materials traditionally at the top of the list, marble and bronze. My second example of how stucco appears to have gained a, a certain nobility in the Veneto returns us to the sculptor with whom I began this lecture, Camillo Mariani, and I remind you of his stuccos eminently Veronese-esque in style at the Villa Cornaro um, in Piemontese. Now, Bariani began his career as a stuccoist at the Teatro Olimpico in Vicenza, which ranks as one of the greatest stucco enterprises of the 16th century. Bariani was only a teenager when the stuccos were underway, between about 1581 and 1584. As such, he was likely just working in the capacity of assistant, learning the techniques of stucco, like how to form the, the metal armatures that are used to support these figures. Um, but working at the Teatro may also have given him the opportunity to, to meet or at least lay his eyes on the elder Veronese. Um, thanks to this drawing, we know the great painter was probably involved with the Teatro. Um, the, the drawing is thought to record his designs for costumes to be used in the inaugural performance at the Teatro, which took place in 1585. Perhaps Veronese had visited the Teatro on some earlier occasion and seen the decorations in progress. Perhaps at that moment he, he ran into the young Camilla Mariani. Even if so, the encounter must have been brief, and it can hardly explain why Mariani's stuccos at the Villa Cornaro are, are so Veronese-esque in style. One factor that does help to explain the stuccos is Mariani's clear belief that stucco was a suitable material for serious works of sculpture. And these can be counted as serious in the way they appear to represent a sculptural response to the main currents of painted portraiture as practiced by Veronese and other artists in the Veneto. One of the proofs that Mariani belonged to a culture that prized stucco as highly, um, and this is my, my second indication of the ennobling of stucco, um, is found in this poem, which I, I came across um, in the library in Vicenza. 
It's part of a small book of poems that was published in 1625, but internal clues indicate that it must have been written um, during the late 1590s, thus just after Mariani had finished his stuccos at the Villa Cornaro. The poem which is dedicated to Mariani is written a la rustica, uh, meaning in a dialect that, that was popular among a group of literary sophisticates living in and around Padua and Vicenza. Um, I, I show my translation on the screen and bring your attention to the line in red, where the author claims that Mariani's skills as a sculptor is so great he could vanquish the preeminent talents of Greek sculpture Phidias and Praxiteles with either stucco, stucco, or his chisel. So here, marble and stucco are directly equated, um, which is certainly an equation to which Mariani subscribed, and, and we can also be sure that the equation was foundational for pushing Mariani um, to engage the commission with all the seriousness and aspirations for artistic excellence um, as any commission he might receive in marble or bronze. Um, to him, these, these weren't to be trifles of decoration. They deserve serious engagement with the latest trends in Venetian art, and these trends um, tend to delay in painting. And I've held this fact back from you up to this moment, but Mariani was a practicing painter. Um, at least towards the end of his life. Um, we don't have any evidence whether he was actively painting at the time of the Villa Cornaro Stuccos, um, but I do think he was, in which case we gain additional verification that in designing the Stuccos, Mariani had his eyes on paintings, and, and almost doubtlessly ones by Veronese. Um, the conclusion to the story is a fantastic one, but I must be brief. Uh, Mariani moved to Rome in, in the late 1590s. In 1600, he was given the commission for this cycle of monumental saints in the small church of San Bernardo alle Terme. Um, the material would be stucco, and the results, sculptures unlike any Rome had seen before. And, and this is for two reasons. First, stucco had not achieved the same level of prestige in Rome as it had attained in the Veneto. Um, it was still very much considered a decorative material. There were hardly any freestanding stuccos in Rome, which stands in obvious contrast to the Veneto. Uh, I must save the explanation for another lecture, but I do point out that, that Rome, of course, had a much more abundant supply of marble than Venice. The second reason why the stuccos are unlike any Rome had seen before, and uh, I show a close-up of two of them here, um, is that they represented a, breath of, a fresh breath of stylistic air in Rome. For their elegance and naturalism, they broke new stylistic ground, ground that would not receive another proper tilling until the ascendancy of the young John Lorenzo Bernini during the 1610s. Um, back in Venice, stucco continued to be esteemed, viewed as Mariani viewed it, as a noble material suitable for noble sculpture. And I, I end with the, the freestanding stuccos that are in that temple of uh, Veronese's art, San Sebastiano. There by Girolamo Campagna, Alessandra Vittoria's chief rival in sculpture during the final decades of the 16th century. Their date is uncertain. They might be as late as the 1590s, um, but they definitely came after the frescoes. Now, two of them are hard to distinguish, um, uh, perhaps easier on the big screen, but they're, they're back here in the, uh, the corners. And um, this is instructive in itself. They, they very much blend into the frescoes which underscores the degree to which they seem to step out of the frescoes. And you can appreciate the similarities in pose here uh, between Veronese's fresco in the back and Campagna's stucco up front. Um, there was certainly no question that these figures should be in stucco. Cost is, is likely to have been the biggest factor in the choice of material. But Campania is probably to have been aware, too, that marble would have represented a strange choice in San Sebastiano, where Veronese's fictive sculptures, even the large ones, owe a debt to the flourishing of stucco sculpture in the Veneto um, and to Veronese's appreciation for that flourishing. Now, disappointingly, Campania did not seize on the advantages of stucco as Mariani did. His figures, such as the archangel Gabriel, um, look very much like Campania's figures in marble. But they do portend the future of sculpture um, in one way, and I, I return to the general view, where you see how the two at the front, uh, the Archangel Gabriel and the Virgin, um, perform the act of uh, the Annunciation. 
the dialogue across real space and how, how the performance serves to sort of electrify that space has a dimension of Baroque theatricality. Um, but I don't want to overplay Stucco's part in this. The same ensemble could have been realized in marble easily enough. Um, although I suspect the commission never would have stood a chance unless Campagna was willing to go the cheaper route of stucco, and, and clearly he was. Um, he signed his stuccos prominently, um, a clear sign of his pride in them. Here, Veronese stood in the background, one whose art and career drew from and contributed to the ennobling of stucco sculpture in the Veneto. Thank you very much. Well, bravissimo. Great content and delivered on time. It makes my heart happy. So that means um, we all have a 15-minute break. So um, we want to keep things moving forward. So um, be back at 11 o'clock, please. <laughs>